that you selected in the list of 40, the idea of understanding yourself better and understanding other people better. In your opinion, in this group, who do you, which person would you say represents the best picture of someone who's physical? Carter. Carter? <laughs> <laughs> Carter, would you come up, please? Okay, number two. The uh, your choice of the person who's the most mental, intellectual, Royce. out of the groups. Royce. Oh, Royce. Royce. Morris. 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 Rich. Morris. 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 Intellectual. Is it rich? Okay, rich. <laughs> Don't worry, Rich. I'll be standing next to you. Okay, <laughs> one more. Your choice of the person who's most emotional. Royce. 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 <laughs> Everybody got a foot there. <laughs> hey, the Don't cry about me. Don't get emotional. Why'd you quit worrying about it? I had seen past behavior to prove otherwise I would. <laughs> I've done this a few times, and somebody ran to talk back to me. <laughs> okay, what, what, you want to take notes while you do this? Sure. <coughs> He's the mental one. Now, what we have here, I want you to let me metaphor you once again, and let this be one person. See, we made up of three parts. When, when we were born, yep. when a baby was first born, all we were concerned about was physical. Okay? I mean, really... You know, for a few minutes or for a few hours, all we cared about is that he lived, right? We want the baby to live. And probably for the first several weeks, at least, the concern is that we feed you enough and keep you dry and things like that. And totally, almost entirely devote ourselves to the physical well-being of this person. And what's true is then, this prevails throughout the rest of our life, is that we have we give a great deal of attention to the physical. <clears throat> but he wasn't but a matter of, should we say, um, weeks old, maybe months in some cases, that just attending to the physical wasn't enough. Some other needs, you two have got to change places. Thank you very much. Some other needs began to surface. This child can no longer be treated just as a physical person because some emotional needs begin surfacing. There comes a time when we discover that this child is developing another dimension. Sometimes the child is only happy when it's being touched or held. Even though it's dry and it's full, it begins to show some needs for touching. And a little later, for just all kinds of attention. In fact, this child probably in a few months begins to manipulate us with its emotional needs crying when we don't say coochie coo and, <laughs> and, uh, and responding with a smile when we give you attention. So I see this second area of needs begin to emerge and what's true is if we do not attend to those emotional needs, this child will not be healthy and whole. Now, shortly after that, perhaps a little longer span of time, mental needs begin to emerge. Maybe when, the t when, when he started crawling, Okay, he goes around and he picks things up and he looks at them. Long before his mind was working logically, he was absorbing information just by touching things and seeing things. And then the mental needs emerge even more. And before he goes to kindergarten, he probably is able to count to 100 and know the colors and say some of the ABCs and this type of thing. So the progressive development of every human being is that we have physical needs, and we have emotional needs, and we have mental needs. Now this is pretty simple. This is something that you knew. But there's a dimension of it that I hope to add, which once again I, I believe will throw some light on the 2% as we continue to look for that. This is what we call a three-part mechanism. The physical, the emotional, and the mental. Now in the world, pretty much, I'm talking about Society, the institutional world, society, educational institutions, governmental institutions, medical institutions, all of the people with the reputations in the bucks. 
they generally consider this to be a complete person. In fact, there are agencies out there, including the government, that reward us if we stay healthy in these three areas. We'll have the president's program for physical fitness, and we got the people jogging. That's promoted today to keep us strong and healthy, even if it's for nothing more than for us to be in good shape when they start a war. We'll be able to go fight it if we're strong and healthy, you see. Also, they have a great deal of focus upon keeping people emotionally healthy. Some corporations now are having a, a retained counselor or psychiatrist to attend to the emotional needs of people. But see, most places where they reward us for staying strong emotionally is because they want more productivity. And they feel like if the person is sound in their mind and they're balanced in their home, they'll produce better. And then, of course, rewarding us mentally, great, you know, the higher diploma you get in college, the more money you make. And so this becomes the model for what society teaches us is the total person. But you see, there's a flaw in that. Because we're going to discover a little bit that this is not a total person. It's just that all the powers to be in the world consider this to be the total person. This total person right here, or the alleged total person, is a very selfish total person. Because as long as only the body, the emotions, and the mind are involved in their thinking on a daily basis, it is totally selfish. Because, you see, the mind is committed to making sure that the body stays intact. The function of the mind has always been just for our protection and to guard us and to make us smarter so we can protect ourselves better, to make us wiser so we can make more money and have even more comfort for our body. This is a little unit dedicated to self-survival. Even the emotions translate everything in terms of what is the value to me. The emotions of this three-part person lives as if it's a me-first world or a me-only world in many cases. And so in this three-part mechanism, we have a very selfish, but apparently the experience of us all, introverted, self-focused existence. And the world considers that to be complete. Now, until I would say since the 1930s, and more, more accurately, even since the 60s, there became a broad base of knowledge in discovering that this is not a total person, that there's another dimension to a human being that we had not really categorized before. Now, some ancient teachers and some spiritual movements had always talked about this other dimension, but generally, it was not considered to be very credible. However, Today, even in the field of medicine and psychiatry and the human potential movement, et cetera, et cetera, we have learned that there's another dimension of a person required before they can be complete. And for lack of a better word, we refer to this as a spiritual dimension. So what I want is for you all to pick the person who would most typify that spiritual dimension. Who would that be? Scott. Scott? Matthew. 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 Okay, Matthew. Come on up. Spirits. <laughs> right department, right department. Practice <laughs> <Not> still. <laughs> Who cares if I'll clarify? <laughs> now, just to tell you how Matthew came on board in this person, it goes like this. This three-part person goes through life excelling and achieving and looking for security and looking to build up the full barns and things of this nature. And no matter how much this three-part person achieves, somewhere, someday, they step back and scratch their head and they say, is this all there is? <laughs> you know? That's the beginning of this guy waking up within the person. It's when they begin to realize that no matter how hard I push and how much I drive, this somehow is not fulfilling me. I'm not rewarded the way I thought I would be. Now, while that side experiences as negative, that three-part mechanism, What's really happening is that the fourth part of this person has begun to speak and to say, hey, 
it isn't complete enough for you. There's more of you here that you don't know about yet. Routinely, this begins to happen naturally in a person somewhere after the age of 30. That is, if you go by averages, 30 to 40 years old, that's when people begin to really reassess their value <coughs> and their values and what they're doing with themselves. Other times, it happens sooner by people who truly have a spiritual experience, a transformation, an awakening. It happens to lots of people in a church or spiritual environment, and it happens to lots of people in a training environment such as this where they really awaken to another dimension of themselves. All set? Yeah. Uh, do you know out of, there's only seven desert rivers in the world, and three of them are here in Arizona?
simple file, some of you may want to copy it. I've gone over this a couple times before with some of the people in this room, so I'm going to zip through it again real fast. Now, when we deal with the four-part mechanism, that's when our feelings come alive. You see, until the fourth dimension comes alive, we usually just react on emotion. Our life is almost constantly mental, emotional, mental, emotional. When the fourth part of us comes alive, it's like a new dimension has come. I begin to feel for the first time, really feel. You see, there's different levels of feeling, and there's different levels of seeing, and there's different levels of hearing. Tom talked about hearing, and then he talked about hearing. It's more than one level of everything. We often talk about seeing, and then there's really seeing. And then we talk about feeling, and then there's really feeling. Now when I talk about feelings, and this is what we're here in the seminar to get in touch with, I'm talking about the real, genuine, fourth dimensional feelings that all of us are really aspiring to touch and to reach in our lives. In fact, all human beings are after one thing. They're after feeling good. That's the only goal we have. It makes no difference whether you are a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, whether you're in business, whether you work for somebody, whether you vacation, whether you're a bomb, a hobo. It makes no difference. Every human being is pursuing a single thing. They're pursuing the kind of feeling that they want. Now, it's important for us to know that about ourselves because if all I'm looking for is the feeling, I might be able to get it without so much blood, sweat, and tears. You know, because I may have convinced myself I can only feel good one way. And then I go and pay that awesome price. Also important to remember that when a customer comes into the restaurant, the customer is coming to get the feeling they want. Many times that has nothing to do with the food, or little to do with the food. Many times it may not have to do with the environment. Yeah. Who knows what it will take to give that customer the feeling they want. But if they get the feeling they want, they'll come back. And if they don't get the feeling they want, they won't come back. So you see, having this insight into people, you can be committed just to making sure that when the people come in, they get the feeling that they want it. And that generally will come from you. They will pick up you when they come in and your attitude, your intention, where you come from, that type of thing. This little invisible area, which is the 2% that we're looking for, so that whoever walks in your door, you do something or you be something that makes them glad they came. Okay? So this is the single goal of all human beings, feelings. The second thing I want to point out is that there's only one road to get the feelings that you want. There's only one way to get there but one road, and that's the road of fear. Now, I'll explain what that is so it doesn't sound too esoteric here in just a moment. But I think it's very important for you to know, to be conscious of the fact that everything you want in life that you don't now have is on the other side of fear. It doesn't matter what it, no matter what it is. You've got to face some kind of fear to have anything you want. And the same is true for your customers. You know when they come in two things about them. Number one, they're looking to feel good. Number two, they're scared. They might not be scared of you, but their whole life is a pursuit of something that they're afraid to face. It may be the fear of cancer, heart attack, a pain in their right side, financial problems, problem at home, atom bombs, whatever it is, every human being is running from something. Now, to elaborate upon that a moment so that you'll know more about yourself, all of us live with fear hanging over us at all times. And importantly so, because fear is our motivator. See, we're in, this is our dream right here, to have a good feeling. We're inspired by our dreams We're motivated by our fear. Yeah. 
here's what I mean. Think about it for a moment. Because I really want to close with you on this point before I move on. Everything you're after, everything you pursue in life and me, the human way, because there's only one road that we all travel. We never pursue something because we want it, per se. We pursue something because we're running away from something else. It's a human way. We are negatively oriented. We don't go to college for 10 years just to have that diploma and be smart. We go to college for 10 years because we fear being stupid and failing. We don't go through relationships and the pain of relationships just because we want love. What's true is that we fear loneliness. We don't go to church just because we love God. What it is is we fear hell. You see, when we look at ourselves closely, we discover that every move that we make is a running from something. When you go on the ropes tomorrow, more than anything, you will be motivated to excel on the ropes because you're afraid of your own lack of courage. You're afraid of failing. You're afraid of cowardice. You're afraid of non-achieving. And you will want to excel because of what you're afraid of. Humans are naturally negatively oriented at all times. So we run from something. When your customers come in, how good it is to know that you're a step ahead of them. You know more about their life than they do. They're running from something. If you know that about them, you can give them a couple of hours peace by helping them get the feeling they want and for that little short time they are not afraid and I promise you if you can help somebody be free from their fear for two hours and feel good in the process you'd have a benefactor they will come back again and again and again because there's hardly any place on this planet that someone can go and get this and this attended to in the same place at the same time what an incredible thing if you as a group would commit yourself as much to people as you have to food, as much to people as you have to restaurants, to attend to their two basic needs. Point three. Now, as we travel down the road of life, what we find, all of us, is that we can go so far, and then we run into a wall. It seems like we can only go so far what we do. And we hit that solid wall. You've all experienced it. Let me help you identify. It's like when you were younger and you first were aspiring to choose a career or go into business, get a job or whatever. It was your dream to be super rich, to have several automobiles, have the finest home in at least two different places, to have bank accounts, to vacation around the world. See, that's what we all aspire to have. But what happened? Somewhere along the way, we discover that most of us don't get that. It's like we hit a wall. And then we begin to level off and settle for X number of dollars income. The most travel we do is Take a trip to Scottsdale occasionally, you know. Uh, the several automobiles may mean a second car that's used. Uh, the money that you aspire to having may be a credit card. You know, somewhere we begin to scale back because we have hit the wall of what we were able to achieve. In relationships, you aspire, you dream of having that perfect love. And somewhere, someday, you wake your head, you shake your head, and you realize, this isn't half what I thought it would be. I'm not really happy in this relationship. I look like a little wall. We can only get along so good. We hit that wall. Some of us hit the wall with our health. A business hits the wall. You grow, 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 and then all of a sudden you stop growing. Can't get any bigger. Hit the wall. But see, that's the human experience. Every human hits the wall. Where and when do they hit the wall? 
when they had reached their personal capacity. This was the wall of capacity. When you are, when you have reached the place where you are realizing all you can handle, it stops for you and you can go no further. Some of you, for various reasons, and it gets into psychology, and I won't get into that today, but some of you can only have so much love in your life. Because you see, if I had you as a psychology client, I would help you see that you feel you only deserve so much love. And once you get all that you deserve, or you think you deserve, you absolutely will destroy your relationship. You will kill it. Because you've had all you think you deserve. Your internal integrity is so strong that it will not allow you to have what you think you don't deserve. For those of you who haven't realized your income potential yet, I promise you that there is a level of income where if you went beyond it, you would not feel like you deserve it. And once you hit that level, that is your wall. And you will not make more money. And if you do make more money, you will make sure that you lose it. Because you cannot allow yourself to have more than you feel you're entitled to. And a business can get so big, and when the business gets as big as the collective consciousness of its people believes they deserve, the business will grow no further. It stops. Because we will not allow ourselves to have it. So whether it's wealth, whether it's love, whether it's whatever, education, health, when you reach your capacity, you are finished. Now here's the tricky part of it. Once you reach your capacity, you stop growing. Life, the whole of life, does not allow anything or anyone to be static. You can take a housing project and sell all the houses but one. And that one house sitting there with nobody in it will deteriorate faster than the house that people are living in because there's no life in it. You've driven through neighborhoods and you've seen it. None of the houses have been painted, but the one that wasn't occupied needs painting the worst because life will not allow anything to be static. It either is expanding or it's dying. One of the two. So it would be neat in your relationships of love if you could, you know, reach your capacity and then just maintain there. Because that's pretty good. It doesn't work that way. Once you reach your capacity, then it starts deteriorating and goes back into you. The same with income. You reach your limit on a job where you can advance no further on this job. It'd be nice to maintain there. Maybe you're making a good living, but it won't happen. In a few years, you will deteriorate on that job. And you'll end up making less money or being terminated once you reach your capacity. A business, once it gets as big as it can be, it would be neat for Bobby McGee to have 20 profitable units, but it can't be. Because if it stops expanding, it dies. We must expand before we die as a corporation. The only way that can happen is you individuals must expand before you die. Because the company is only a reflection of the people that run it. And when you're alive, it's alive. When you're dead, it's dead. When you're nominal, it's nominal. When you're ordinary, it's ordinary. <coughs> when you're sad, it's sad. Because there is no such thing as a company. There's only people. And we often think that the company is outside us. Never one. <coughs> Capacity. That's the wall that we hit. And this is our water loop. This is where we stop. In psychology, we call this the place of sabotage. This is where we destroy our lives, our relationships, 
our businesses when we reach our capacity. There's only one obstacle for all people. That is when we reach our capacity. See, all people, we have only one, one goal in life, that's to feel good. We only have one road to travel to get there, that's the road of fear. We only have one obstacle in life, that is when we reach our capacity. All people on the planet are exactly the same. How sad if we had to stay there. We can get through the wall, there's a gate. But there's only one gate. Just one way to get past this point. That way is the way of giving. That's the gate. 